Welcome to the Northeast Kingdom Voice. I'm your host, Scott Wheeler. The Korean War has been called the Forgotten War. Today's guests have not forgotten that war. Both of them are veterans of the Korean War. To, my, to the far left is Arthur Preeby of Newport. And to my immediate left is Ad Taylor of Barton. Welcome to the show. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank well, you. It was great that uh, you decided to come on because, uh, you know what, I think we were talking beforehand is uh, some guys, some people don't even know you exist. The Korean War. You know, everybody knows World War II, mm -hmm. the Vietnam War, then our current wars, but sometimes you guys are forgotten. Yeah. Do you feel sometimes. that's the case, Arthur? Yeah, sometimes they don't seem to mention the Korean War. Right. Yeah, all the other wars, but Korean War is very seldom but why mentioned. But why do you think that is? I don't know. I don't have no idea why they... Hmm. Uh, now, what about you, Ad? Why and, do you, uh, why do you think more? you're forgotten? Because you were well, telling uh, me, you were <laughs> telling me one year when you, when, when your community should have been celebrating uh, the, the, the 60th, Korean War. 60th anniversary of the Korean War. And instead you celebrated another war. We, we celebrated the World War II right. for about the fifth year in a row. Right. And, and, <laughs> and so how, was, do you, uh, how do you feel about being forgotten? Well, I, it doesn't bother me. Uh, I think the only ones that haven't really forgotten us is uh, the South Korean government and the South Korean people, which uh, uh, last June gave us a a nice reception uh, down at Essex Center and uh, awarded us with all of these uh, plaques and medals and citations and uh, I didn't bring any military ribbons or anything because I right. but I did bring the these things from the Korean government because right. it is the forgotten war that uh, we want remembered. And Arthur you weren't able to go to this function because you said you had appointments? Yeah I had an appointment with the doctor so I'd like to make it, but I couldn't make it. You, you know, I think the one thing I hosted, I don't know if either one of you were there, I ho well, my family hosted a welcome home celebration for the Vietnam and the Korean War veterans yes, a few, few years there. ago. And a lot of, uh, one speaker said something that I thought uh, was interesting is, they, they say that the Korean War was a stalemate. But if you get right down to it, if you look at the Korea of today, the North Korea of today, and the South Korea of today, I think you could argue that you guys actually won the war. Well, the, the division is still right back to the 38th parallel where it was before. But they're not, but on the other hand, North Korea is not in South Korea. No. No, they, uh, that's when the war started, of course, 25th of June, 1950, and when the North Korea Cross the 38th parallel to right. take over South Korea. Right. So let's let's go back in time. Since I'm going to start with you, Ad, because I think you were in country before Arthur, right? Yes, I, I was in Japan a year before the war broke out. So we were some of the first to get over there. And right. So who is Ad Taylor? Let's oh. back up. To, <laughs> where did you grow up? I grew up around Orleans County. Uh, I went to Barton Academy. And uh, after the, you want me to go back to yeah. my life then? Uh, an Army recruiter came to talk to us our senior year and uh, promised us uh, we could go into the, any part of the service we wanted. So when I enlisted in uh, November of, of uh, 1948, I was guaranteed that I could go to heavy equipment operator school. So after basic training, I went to Fort Belvoir, Virginia, to dozer operator, and uh, after that, uh, I was sent to Japan, where I went to grader operator school, and was a grader operator when I went to Korea. That was my primary job in Korea, was operating a grader. Now, when you started up, though, when you joined the military, well, were you thinking that, well, you know, World War II had just ended a few years earlier, did you really think you'd be going to war? No, we never thought a thing about it. <laughs> what were you just thinking, maybe and, uh, get some training? In fact, I didn't think of anything about it until uh, we were ordered to uh, ship out. We had to 
load up our equipment on uh, landing crafts that uh, the U.S. had given the South Korean government. And uh, with a Japanese crew, we were five days on our way to Korea where we, uh, in the meantime, uh, waterproofed our equipment for beach landing. And uh, that was it. We uh, landed Po Hong Dong on the east coast of Korea. Of Korea. And uh, then get into action from there. Right. Did anything prepare you growing up in Orleans County for going to Korea? Oh, probably no. the probably <laughs> some of the weather in the winter. Well, the weather is quite similar. I think Korea was probably uh, uh, more bitter cold than we have here in Orleans County. Especially the first year when I was there, we didn't have the winter equipment because uh, we were told that we'd be over there and back in Japan by Thanksgiving Day and when Thanksgiving came and went, uh, they said Christmas then and, and three, if I three years later they were really still there. And I, I interviewed you several years ago. Uh, didn't you say back then that some of your equipment, your boots and that had dry rot from being yeah, in storage yeah. from like World War II? Yeah, we really didn't have the good winter equipment that uh, I suppose they had probably the next winter. Okay, Arthur, uh, same question. Is a little bit about who is Arthur Preeby? Well, I worked in the uh, Indian Head and I worked uh, driving bus and I worked uh, uh, Butterfield and I run a bread route and uh, I was pretty well always in Newport. All my life I was in Newport. And when did you decide, did you, did, did you decide to join up in the military? No, I was drafted. You were drafted. Yeah, we were drafted for 21 months and then as well after they gave us three months more so we had to stay in for 24 months. Right. And when were you drafted? In 51. 51. And when did the war begin? June 25, 1950. Right. So, so you were drafted with a purpose of very possibly going to Korea. Yeah. Yeah. How did you feel when you got that draft notice? Well, I figured there's nothing I could do. Right. So I went ahead and, and I had quite an experience because I was in the uh, well, you'd be Pine Camp, uh, first it was Fort Devon, right. and then we went to Pine Camp, New York. Mm -hmm. Today it's called Camp Drum. Mm -hmm. right. okay. And then we went down to West Point to train the cadets. <coughs> we were there for three months, then we went back to Pine Camp. Then that's when the, they decided to ship me to Korea. Right. So I was there six months, and then my time was up, so I come back to the States. Right. Now, who were you, uh, mm. which division were you with? With the 25th Division. They used to call it the Lightning Division. The Lightning Division. And who were you with that? Those were the 1st Cav, the 8th Combat Engineers, right. the 1st Cavalry Division. Now, I know you weren't there at different, you were there at different times, but would your divisions have crossed paths? The divisions, uh, 25th was over the same time 1st right. Cav was, but uh, apparently it's before uh, Arthur got over there. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And you were a heavy equipment operator. Yep. And you operated what? I was working on the the <coughs> the, hell, the, the houses. Right. And you uh, you mm -hmm. uh, were telling me before the show some of the battles that you <coughs> were in. You were in a, at least a couple notable yeah, battles. Yeah, it was in uh, Punch Bowl. Yeah. Then went into Heartbreak Ridge, and then we were south of the 38th parallel. Right. But what I understand, when we were there, they always said we can't go above the 38th parallel. <coughs> so yeah, I think if we could have went up further, it might have been uh, profitable. Right. But we couldn't go above the 38. We had to stay behind that. Right. We had already crossed the 38th parallel <coughs> into Pyongyang, the North Korean capital. Right. Yeah. When I was there. So how come he? How come you could, but they uh, couldn't? I, I don't understand why. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently, they'd drawn the 38th parallel as a dividing line again. Right. 
before the war, before mm -hmm. the armistice was signed. What was your equipment? You heard what his equipment was like. You know, he was the first on the ground. Were your was your winter equipment better than say his? That well, we I was there to uh, uh, first part of December, and that's when the winter started. Then we started getting snow and cold weather, and then uh, they shipped me back to the state because my time was up. I was getting out in January, so I didn't spend much of the winter there. Right. You know, how does, you know, I've asked all, I've never served in the military, and I've certainly never been in combat, <laughs> but I've interviewed Vietnam veterans, I've interviewed uh, World War II veterans, Korean veterans, um, you know, the current, the veterans of current wars, but how does, especially back in your generation where, you know, you weren't going by the TV, because today I think you kind of know what you're getting into, but back then your world was really <laughs> small. Did either one of you really travel that much before the war? Mm, no, no, I never traveled that much. I went to Missouri and worked on construction after I got out of high school for a few months before I went <laughs> in the service. But that was the extent of my, my traveling. <laughs> so, so how did, how did you adjust, you know, like here, you, you, like I know Arthur, you used to be a big <laughs> trapper, mm. but you're used to being the hunter and not the hunted. How does your mindset, you know, how, how do you change? Uh, I don't know, I don't really, it hasn't really changed that much. No. Yeah, but how do, you, how do you accept, you know, how is it being the first time that you're in combat? That must be a, you know. Well, it's quite an experience mm -hmm. because uh, you don't expect uh, what you're going to see or what you're going to do. So it's really a, a big experience. Yeah. Did you ever, did you ever fear you wouldn't come home? Well, that was a risk. We never, we never knew what was going to, we got bombed a couple of times and that, but it wasn't that bad. And I had a good chance to come back because I was on the 105 and uh, the infantry and the motors were ahead of us. Right. So that was more danger than what we were in. Right. Mm -hmm. What about you, uh, now you, when, when people think about driving greater and that, they think about, you know, maybe greater in the roads of Derby or something. Uh, there must have been a little more challenge when you're in a war zone, grading roads. Yeah, we graded roads and built airstrips and uh, there was a danger. In fact, uh, this book on the 8th Engineers is uh, written by Frank Armstrong and dedicated to all the ones that were killed in, uh, in action. And my assistant operator was killed in action just before I uh, came home okay. from, from Korea. Uh, he uh, was operating, hit a landmine with the blade of the grader and all the shrapnel come up in his face and died in the hospital from it. I know I had a relative during uh, World War II that was actually severely injured. Uh, he was a heavy equipment operator and he, uh, he ran onto a mine and it blew up, but the, he used to take it, he used to be talk about it a bit tongue in cheek because being a World War II vet, a lot of his records were lost in Missouri and uh, during a fire. Mm -hmm. And in later years, when his injuries started acting up, uh, they, the VA used to tell him that those were not uh, war-related. And he said, well, he said, I'm, uh, I don't know how you'd say it weren't war-related when I ran onto a landmine. <laughs> and yeah. and, and he, he finally won. Mm -hmm. But he, he mm -hmm. used to actually chuckle about it. Because I know you've graded uh, a lot of roads in Orleans County, and I <laughs> bet you have not ran onto one landmine. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, so how many years has it been since the end of the war? Well, 1953, it's, uh, this year will be 60 years so on the end of the, of the signing of the armistice. But uh, three years ago, of course, was the 60th anniversary of the start of the war. Okay. Do you think about your war years at all? Is that just a piece of your history? I don't, I don't uh, think too much about them. In fact, I, I don't watch war movies or 
or uh, talk about the service, uh, talk about the combat I was in. Right. But do you do you think it shaped you in any how you know you know for better or worse? Well, I guess you might say it was a good experience uh, as long as you come out of it right. without any injuries. Uh, but I also know you're a proud veteran because every Memorial Day, I believe it is, you take part in a... Memorial Day, uh, Fourth of July, and right. Veterans Day when I'm when I'm around here. Right. Yeah. And uh, but but you don't you don't dawn on it. This is just just part of your part of your life. It's just respect to the ones that have that have ser served and uh, passed on. Right. I know. Uh, I uh, I spoke to. Uh, you know, there was there's not a lot of you. It's not like the World War II veterans where, you know, if you're in your 80s and you were, if you're in your late 80s now and you're a man, there's a darn good chance that you've, uh, you were in World War II. Mm -hmm. It isn't true. You know, for me to find the Korean War veterans, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's not easy finding Korean War veterans. But mm -hmm. I was, I was talking to one woman. Uh, she lost her brother in Korea. And uh, she said the hardest part for her about losing her brother mm -hmm. that she has never totally reconciled it is they never had a body. They, uh, they know he starved to death yeah. in a mm -hmm. uh, prison camp. Mm -hmm. But they, she said she never has totally gotten over that. But uh, mm -hmm. did, you guys, did you guys involve, you, were you uh, involved with the Korean people at all, Arthur? Uh, we talked to some. We had a fence around where we were, and uh, some of them, young people, used to come up and talk with us. But it was fenced in, so we couldn't have any contact with them at all. But so you didn't worry yeah. about what was going on, like say, like today in Afghanistan, how you're yeah. having some people infiltrate yeah. and then blow you guys up. Mm -hmm. You didn't have to worry no, about that? No, we didn't worry about that, no. It's, what about you, Ad? We, we knew there was people working in the rice paddies that were probably uh, trans <coughs> transferring information to the enemy. But uh, no, we didn't have much to do with them. Uh, through the winter when the, the ground was froze up so much that it couldn't really do much of the graders, I was transferred to a line company. And in this uh, line companies, we had uh, two uh, South Korean ROK soldiers in every squad that uh, that was right. in the, in Korea there, and uh, some you could trust, some you couldn't. We mm -hmm. we had one that was a real nice fellow that would go out in the villages and get us chickens and things like that to uh, eat, and, and then we had another one that uh, turned a gun on himself and then tried to get the squad squad leader before he drop but didn't make it work. Hmm. Do you think they wanted to see you there, the South Koreans? Oh yes, I think they did. Yeah, yeah. I think mm -hmm. they definitely did because it goes to show now with the appreciation that, right. that they, mm -hmm. they show us all the time uh, on the 50th anniversary there. I get this citation from the, from right. the South Korean president mm -hmm. and then last year as we mentioned uh, the ceremony they had for us would uh would uh, Arthur, mm -hmm. if you had a chance to return to Korea, you know some people go on, mm -hmm. they return. Yeah, you know, it's something they feel they have to do, no matter what war. Some people feel a need to return. Would you go back to South Korea? Uh, no, not really, mm -hmm. not really. And then you date the one that they got now, uh, running North Korea. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's a young person, and he don't know much. <laughs> because he's never been through the war, he's never had any experience or anything. He thinks it's just a, a game to play that there'll be no trouble that they're going to win. But I doubt it. We're pretty well situated in that they're going to have a hard time if they ever start again. Well, in th that's the thing is, do you think, like with the leader of North Korea, do you think, like as I said, is I can interview you guys, I can interview hundreds of veterans, but I wasn't there, I have never experienced it. If you have never seen war, do you think you can, do you think anybody can truly understand what it's like? 
Uh, in one way, no, probably, because uh, you don't uh, know what it's like till you really go and you're, you're there. Otherwise, a lot of people don't think it's that bad. Right. I, I can't imagine, because I've known you all my life, and yeah. I, I, I don't think I knew until like the last 10 years that you even served in the military. Yeah. And I met Ad, uh, oh, must be uh, going on almost 10, 10 years ago, but I, uh, that was when I did a story on you. And uh, so uh, do, you, uh, do you harbor any bad feelings towards the Korean people or the North Koreans? Uh, not really. Some... Uh, they're run by the government, so they're pushed to do things which uh, you wouldn't be doing it if it wasn't because of the government pushing them. Right. Now, do you, we talked, I, Ad talked about how this is just a piece of his life and it's, you know, it's not something he dawns on. How do you compartmentalize this as part of your life, as in the war? Does it bother you at all or is it just something that happened to you years ago. Yeah, it's just something that happened years ago, and I don't regret of going, but uh, I know the way they do today, there's a lot of different uh, ways they fight the war, so it's more danger and there's more problems. And But you guys also had a lot of a lot of, you know, today you can fight a certain element of your war from way away. Yeah. War in your day was a lot of times up close and personal. Yeah, you had to be right up there, especially the infantry. Right. The infantry was right up, right face to face with them nearly. Hmm. So that was a bad thing right there. So hmm. looking back, Ad, was the war worth it? Was it wor wor worth it to Korea, and was it worth it for, you know, just, you know, as a world? It might have been worth it for the South Koreans, because uh, I'm sure the U.S. has put a lot of money into South Korea to rebuild it. Because mm -hmm. uh, the MC to this uh, ceremony we had last summer said that he was 12 or 13 years old when the Korean War was on, and uh, Apparently, it had been Korea since then, and uh, he says every time he goes back to Korea now, he said he, he has to get a taxi to take him around Seoul because it's rebuilt so he doesn't recognize, doesn't know where he is. Now, were you in Seoul? I was through Seoul, yeah. And what was it like then? Well, it was it was a very small, to me, it was a small place, and uh, of course, war torn. Right. Do you think it was worth it, Arthur? Uh, one way probably it was, it was a big help and show that uh, they won't push uh, American people around like they intended to do. Right. So, right. But when we were over there, we lived in the, we had these bunkers, we used to cut logs and that, and we made the bunkers out of logs, and then we filled sandbags. Hmm. So that's what we were living in. We were. It was two bunk beds in there, so we were four people by each uh, building that we had, and that's what we had to live in. And what did you live in in that? Oh, lots of times I, I lived on top of the greatest seat, and sometimes under the greatest. <laughs> <laughs> so depending you, you, you the, lived wherever you could. Depending <laughs> on uh, what yeah. was coming in the, at the time. If we needed the protection, we kind of slip under the grater, or if things are calm, we try to get up on top out of the mud. Did you guys, did you count your days down, Arthur? Like, I know, I know a lot of the people I've spoken to in the wars, they, they count their, they counted your days down, or if you were a pilot, you counted your flights. Yeah, we used to count, count the days down, but after the government, we had 21 months, then they add another three months. Oh, so you never knew. That didn't help much, yeah. Yeah, we counted the days down, and uh, yeah, we, uh, when we went to Japan, on our way back, Japan was pretty, I don't remember what place we were, but uh, we were there at Christmas time, and it was just like it is now, just like summertime. Right. Yeah, we spent uh, about a week here, and then 
we by boat we come back to Seattle, Washington. It took us ten days, but when we went over, we went by Alaska, and uh, we left off about five thousand troops in Alaska, and uh, then we went to Japan, and then right. we went to Korea by boat. So uh, I think you were in uh, Japan too, correct? I was in Japan a year how, before the war broke out. So how 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 were the Japanese people? Because you know they were just. A few you were just there a few years after the end of World War Two. Were they were they bitter? Or I was there from 1949 to 1950 when the Korean War broke out. So how were the people? Uh, to me, I, I didn't I didn't trust uh, too many of them, right. but uh, a lot of a lot of the GIs did uh, fraternize with them, but uh, not me. I, I know to this day there is a. Some of the Japanese, uh, some of the uh, Americans who fought in the Japanese theater, they're not very forgiven of the no. Japanese soldiers. Whereas, if you fought against the Germans, there's I, I find there's a lot of maybe not forgiveness, but kind of understanding. Um, how did you find the people of Japan, Arthur? Uh, not too bad because we weren't there very long. The most we were there. When we went to Korea, we were there about two weeks. Then we had come back, we were there just a week. But uh, a lot of them were pretty friendly. If you went shopping to the stores or something, yeah, they uh, seemed to encourage the people. Uh, they liked the people there. Right. So uh, a lot of people I interview also, they like, you know, because uh, veterans, are pretty much of a proud group of people. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, whether they, they served in a war that was unpopular uh, or whether they wanted to go, a lot of them are still proud. And they, some of them have maintained relationships with their, the people they served with for decades. Have either one of you maintained any relationships with the people you served with? Not me. No, 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 no not, not even, uh, not even the ones in my, Unit, I lost all track of. Uh -huh. Yeah, because when I went in, it was mostly people from the south. It was the National Guard from the south was up with us. Right. So do, you, do you ever wish you had stayed in contact, or is that just something that you? Yeah, I, I, I do. I I did stay in contact with one fellow for a while, and I did uh, stop at his place in Alabama one time coming up th through Alabama. And uh, that was the only time I, we didn't keep a correspondence, and uh, the only time I saw him since the service. We talked about yeah. course. I didn't meet, uh, well, when we left, some of us went to Korea and others went to different places. So we didn't uh, really know too much one another, and we didn't uh, bother with uh, to write or. Right contact either one right. of them because we were all separated. And right. Well, you, you talk about writing. This is, you know, your era of warrior is so much different than today. Today, you can get on the internet from the war zone. Yeah. And you can, you can correspond <laughs> back and forth to home. Yeah. And you didn't have any, how often did you get letters from home? Uh, pretty often, I get pretty often, yeah. But you couldn't get on the telephone and call home. No, and, no, you uh, couldn't, no. And, but yeah. today it's so much, and yeah. I don't know, some soldiers, some veterans wonder if that's worse, though, because, you know, what I've been told is, by, uh, by people who've been in combat, is you almost have to put that, your other life behind you, so you're not worrying constantly. Yeah. And... You got to be careful what you say too, because uh, there's certain things you can't mention, even in the letters they used to. Uh, during the Korean War it wasn't so bad, but the other war, mm. they used to open the letters, and they used to cut out some sections or cross them out if people uh, happened to put something to mention what area they were in or something. They used to cross that out. So I think they checked all the mail that was coming from overseas. Now, were either one of you married at the time you went to war? I wasn't. No. Oh. no. So you didn't have to. You didn't have to fret about a uh, spouse no. back. No. How did no. your parents take it? 
well, we were six boys, and we ended out, five of us, ended out in the war. Oh, five Some, of you? Yeah, there was, uh, I was, uh, me and my younger brother, we were around the Korean War, and, and uh, the others were in the Second World War. Yeah. So, so your, your family really, uh, they pulled the load then yeah. to serve, service yeah, to the really. country. What about, do you, do you go back into the, I know your, uh, your son, who I'm friends with, is a big Civil War buff. Yeah. <laughs> does uh, service to your country, does that run deep, or are you like I, this old person? I, I'm not that interested in the history, really. Right. Yeah. So. No, but has other family members uh, served in the military? In the well, my oldest brother's in World War II in the Navy CBs. Right. And uh, had two other brothers that served uh, right. in the Navy, both of them. Right. Yeah. Later on, uh, Eric, when you when you're watching the TV today, you're well not so much today because you know the the news have uh, seemed to have lost an interest in what's <coughs> going on in Korea. But for mm -hmm. until the latest crises, the political crises and the the bombing in Boston, we were on a day to day basis. We were having that the little leader there of uh, Korea, which you know you have a hard time yeah. taking them seriously, yeah. but you know, when you have all those bombs, I suppose you have to take them seriously. But are we going to end up back in Korea, or is North Korea going to end up back in South Korea? It may be just a pushing idea to try to see how far they can go. I think if they go so far in the United States do something, mm -hmm. then they may be back off. What do you think, Ad? Well, I, I think the U.S. was warning them about uh, the missiles, and uh, it didn't seem to do any good a few weeks ago. Of course, lately I haven't heard too much about it, but uh, I didn't know how long the U.S. was going to just keep warning them and let them right. ignore the warnings and whether someone is done. But right. I figured it's some, some of these days uh, maybe a missile <coughs> is going to <coughs> slip out and land somewhere. But mm. now, during your wars, mm. uh, the the uh, the Chinese involved themselves mm -hmm. against you guys. Yeah. But mm -hmm. right now the Chinese are saying, you know, telling this leader of North Korea, you know, back off. Knock you off. have to back <laughs> off. Yeah. Because yeah. well, the United States are doing a lot of trade with the Chinese, so a lot of manufacturers are going to China, and so they're cutting that out of the states. So China is don't want to do anything. They want to keeping friendly with the United States. Mm -hmm. Right. And, uh, <clears throat> but do you think when all, like my, my gut feeling is I think once it all, uh, all simmers down, maybe I'm just naive, but I think, that, you know, with the world uh, going against this new leader, yeah. I, I have to believe that, uh, that it'll remain the way it is. Uh, but do you think we'll ever see a day when, when, for example, the uh, the Berlin Wall came down and East mm -hmm. and West Germany became one country? Do you yeah. think in your lifetime you'll ever see North and South join together again well, in harmony? <laughs> Probably if they change leaders. But the leader they got now, he's got in his mind that he can do everything, and so he's going to push it as far as he can. It's been 60 years, and they haven't uh, joined yet, so I guess probably the, that uh, 38th parallel will be the dividing line for quite some time, I think. From what I uh, just like when you talk to, uh, like, Boston getting bombed, but you watch on TV, and the, you see where they advertise stores. You can buy all the equipment. They showed on there one time, they had some explosive they put in, uh, on their car there. They blew that car right, right. up in the air. Mm -hmm. And they can sell them. Right. They say the cops don't have right, right to do anything at all. Mm -hmm. And then they have books where you can buy to make bombs. Yeah, yeah you can get right on the, the internet. From the government yeah. too, I guess. They right. should do away with some of that. Mm -hmm. But you know, uh, with all bad said and done about this country, um, 
from what you have seen in traveling, do you think we're a pretty decent uh, place to live? I don't think it's as decent as it used to be, of course, right. but I think uh, it continually, continually gets worse. Right. Yeah. Nothing is safe today. You right. never know what the people, you can't trust nobody today. I, I took the Boston bombing a little personal because uh, before I even knew the, um, um, there had been bombs, my son calls me up and said, did you hear? He says, uh, just let you know I'm okay, but did you hear there was two explosions here? Because yeah. he was two minutes. Because you know, my sons and their girlfriends are yeah. marathoners, and they, my, one of my sons was two minutes from bomb one. Well, yeah, and right. uh, so I kind of took that a bit personal because yeah. I felt that was, not only an attack on our country, not on Boston, but I, I felt like it was an attack on my son and his yeah, girlfriend. Yeah, I see it, yeah. But, um, so, so just to go off in that direction a little bit, did you ever imagine that we would be seeing, you know, like the, the World Trade Centers, the, now the, boss, the, the bomb in there? Did, do you think this is just a sign of things to come? Well, all that is all the foreigners. Right. A lot of foreigners that are coming here, and uh, they don't seem to uh, inspect them the way they should. They always get by somehow and look at them, the bomb the trade center there. Yeah. How much do they come here and learn before that happens? Right. What about you, Dad? Well, it seems to me like they're not doing anything about all the Ill illegals coming in, and uh, then when they do find out they're here, uh, they want to give them amnesty, and so uh, they've already broken the law. But I bet you, though, when you get on a plane, you and your wife are, you know, in your twilight years, I bet you, you know, probably some of those uh, TSA people, they, you know, they're, they're really inspecting you to make sure <laughs> you're not uh, carrying an explosive. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they <laughs> check they everything. They don't have us take our shoes off anymore. <laughs> oh, they don't? No. Uh, when did that no. change? Yeah. Well, uh, sometime last year. Oh, really? Yeah, I, haven't, we, I haven't flown in the last year. When we yeah. flew to uh, St. Paul at uh, Christmas time, we didn't have to take our shoes off. Hmm. Yes. So, um, I mean, if you're over a certain age. You got a right to carry a small knife, would you now? Or did they, we did box, they go back? To, did yeah. they go back to that or not? Uh, to the where, where you could carry a knife. I know that was going back and forth a little bit. Uh, whether you were going to be able. I don't see if you really need a. I don't know if you really need to carry one or not. No. But no. Uh, the. Um, so Ad, I, I asked uh, Arthur about whether he counted his days mm -hmm. down. Uh, did you count your days down? We no, because we never knew when we were going to be able to leave. We couldn't leave till we had replacements. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, uh, what happened was we had three graders in, a, in our uh, engineer unit, and we were scratch. I was scratched, and one other operator was scratched from the list because we uh, had no replacements. Mm -hmm. And then uh, one operator backed his, backed his uh, grader onto a landmine, not knowing it was their course, and and. Uh, didn't get hurt because the engine caught all the shrapnel, but it blew it out of service, so that freed up two operators to to go back on the list. Right. And that's when I that's when I left my unit to come home, and uh, right. and then uh, the next day is when uh, my assistant was was killed. And how long uh, were you in career totally total? About eleven months. And you were six months. Year. Yeah, six months. My time was up, man. Like these medals there, they were given the day I couldn't make it. It seems though the government, uh, we served over there, it seems though they'd have mailed it to whoever couldn't go. Right. It seems though they'd have mailed us you know, those medals in there. I bet you that's still possible. I bet you, you know, you know I would tell you the one person uh, probably to check into is, uh, I, I can't imagine Senator Sanders, prob was, was he there at this function? No. No, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, no, but he, none, of the, none of the... He might be able to help you. Politicians were. Uh, mm -hmm. He might be able to help you out on that. Now, so when you returned home, did you just go back to go back to life as usual? I, I was uh, assigned to Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. Right. And uh, Arthur mentioned his service time was extended uh, three months. 
mine was extended a year <laughs> yeah, by, by Truman because of the war. Mm -hmm. But uh, when I was assigned to Fort Monmouth, I found out that I could, I didn't have to serve my full year because I'd already served my time in Korea. Right. So mm -hmm. I got out about six months early. Right. I only served about six months of that. Uh, then you came extension. back and you became a post, postal mm -hmm. well, carrier? I, I, uh, I could have stayed at Fort Monmouth as a c civil, c yeah. civil service operator. But I know I came back and uh, went to work for the state highway department okay. for about 14 years. And uh, then that, that's when I took a, po a postal exam for, for the rural carrier position. Yeah. And you still mm -hmm. have, you, you still use some of your talents of operating a track, a, a grader now and then. I've, I've operated a grader every, every year since uh, 1950, actually. Right. Because, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, when I was carrying mail, first I had a half-day route, and uh, I run grader for the town of Westmore for the road commissioner there, and did some over Charleston because they didn't have a grader. They mm -hmm. hired they hired uh, Westmore road commissioner grader, and uh, then I, I, my route was consolidated so that uh, I had a full day, but then then time off and mm -hmm. and. Uh, Weekends, Saturdays, uh, I still run greater for a lot of the towns. And yeah, I've seen your face in Derby over the years. I, I run greater for Derby for probably about four four years or so. So, in other words, is your um, your military training still continues to serve you to a degree? It does uh, has used me well, I think. Yeah. Now, what about you? How what did you do when you uh, got out of the service? Well, when I first got out, I went in to work in the body shop. Right. I worked there for a while, and then I, I ran my own bread route for a couple of years, and then uh, I went on the school bus, drive a school bus, and uh, so I did uh, different jobs. I worked at the golf course, and uh, then, uh, like I said, the Indian Head and Butterfield, and right. so I worked uh, quite a few jobs. Do you hear about people coming home with post-traumatic stress or having a hard time adjusting? Did both of you just come <coughs> back to life and just well, carry normal. on? Normal, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I think mean, things are pretty normal. Right. Yeah. If you go to the VA now, they'll always ask you if, you, if you've had any stress or suicidal thoughts yeah. or anything, you know. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you think, you know, today's, uh, uh, today's soldiers, you know, veterans, you know, whether you support the wars or not, um, I, it seems to me like uh, we've learned a lot from how the Vietnam veterans were treated, you know, because whether you supported that war or not, the way they were treated when they returned home, uh, not only by the protesters, but also by their own government sometimes, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I think they really got a raw deal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I think, they, I think we've learned a lot and I, how do you think that the troops are being treated now from what you can see by the government? I think since Vietnam, uh, the way they were treated then, uh, I think the, it's did a complete turnaround now. Right. Yeah, yeah, I heard that too. Uh, those that went to Vietnam, uh, I think it was worse than any other war. That, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it became so political because mm -hmm. I have some good friends, uh, particularly uh, John Wilson, who's the... Mm -hmm. uh, He's the uh, the head of the Newport uh, <coughs> select uh, the Newport Alderman, but then there's yeah, but then there's uh, Winston Carbonell, who used to be the Newport City yeah. Cop, and Gene Tessier, and uh, they're all very very proud veterans, but they also yeah. still carry with them a little bit of in their heart about the way they were treated upon their return. Yeah, some of them, that's it. Yeah, the way they were treated or where they were at war, you take like infantry, they may, I imagine they had a rough time. Oh, they, the all front. three of yeah. those boys, they, yeah, um, they had it tough. Like yeah, yeah, I was in with the, some fellows like uh, Al there that he, he had a year, almost a year to go. I was with some that they had to uh, put in about a year and they said, when I get out, I ain't even going to join the Boy Scout. <laughs> <laughs> well, when we came back, we weren't, we weren't given any celebrations or anything. Uh, no. Yeah, I was going to ask uh, that. 
But you, we just, you, you weren't greeted by any protesters or anything either, were you? No, no. 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 But, uh, but you just came home quietly. Yeah. You just came home quietly. Yeah, yeah, yeah we did. Uh, yeah. I guess the Red Cross or Salvation Army is there to give us a donut yeah. and a cup of coffee but when you get off the ship. But uh, Well, a lot of World War II veterans say there's a misunderstanding about them as well, is if you were home or coming around home right after the end of the war, you may have had celebrations, but they said a lot of them, especially, you know, they came home, they trickled home, yeah, and they just were expected to move on, and yeah. uh, so, uh, um, but the Korean War, again, is, uh, is the war that I swear, I, you know, I went to North Country, possibly we talked about the Korean War, but mm -hmm. I suspect the way it went is I think the way it almost goes now is it's the Civil War, it's World War II, Vietnam, yeah. and then, you know, I, I you might have like a few paragraphs that, and also the mm. Korean War, but I, I just think that, yeah. that you guys, uh, you guys have been given your own raw deal because yeah. I think, you know, I, it shouldn't have been the Forgotten War because you guys served. Just like Iraq. That was going to be a short deal and they were going to, that was a rich country in oil. They were going to have a lot of money and oil, everything in, in there. Everything went to Iraq. Even they build them over again. To, you put them back on their feet and everything and they they didn't get rich like they expected. Do you think you can save a country that doesn't want to be saved? Like, you know, I think Korea, I think South Korea did. But do you think you can save a country that doesn't want to be? No, well, it's pretty hard. Those countries have been fighting for years and years. They and always it will. Seems all, all they know is fight. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you, you know, from two warriors here, do you think the solution, though, in anything, you know, even though you're proud, do you think... Do you think uh, armed conflict is the way, or do you think it should be last resort for any? Well, I think it should be last resort, but uh, mm -hmm. still, I'd rather uh, see the fighting overseas than come to our country. Right. Mm -hmm. What about you? Yeah, yeah. I, I hope it stays over there. No. Right. We if don't you were, get anything here. If you were younger men, all over again. Would you go, would you serve your country once again? Well, if I was called, I'd, I'd go, but uh, volunteer, I don't think I'd really volunteer to go back. Yeah. Yeah. You? I think I'd rather go now, <laughs> now that I'm <laughs> older than uh, when I, back when I was younger. Right. Well, you know, <laughs> in, in closing, I'll, I'll say this, I have a, uh, I don't know if you know uh, Ray Griffin. Ray yeah, Griffin, well, Ray is a World War II vet. His brother was killed in the war. Yeah. Ray carries this document with him. He got it when he was in his 80s and he gets such a chuckle out of it. Being a retired dentist, some, somebody in the War Department the, or the Army got their wires crossed because they sent him this nice letter asking him whether he would reconsider re-enlist. Re this guy was in his 80s yeah. and they mm -hmm. obviously didn't look at the dates very well. And uh, he was wondering if he had to go through basic training again, whether they would let him <laughs> use his cane. Yeah. And uh, be, you know, he, he carries it around with him. He, he obviously knows they got their, you know, they didn't have all their facts yeah. straight. They didn't look at his age, but so. All yeah. right, do you have any final words you'd like to tell the viewers, Arthur? No, not really, no. All right. Yeah. What about you, Ad? No, I, I, I guess not. Just uh, appreciate the invitation to get our points. You're not forgotten and, anymore. Well, no. And uh, the, the program that you put on for the veterans, the Korean veterans, and back at the Elks Club there yeah. several years ago, is, that was appreciated. I've yeah, and we got a chance to say what our opinion is, what we taught of the I different things. and Yeah. yeah. I think everybody needs a voice, and I think sometimes, because uh, that's what my work is, I try to give people a voice. Uh, and, you know, I think too often is, 
you know, the, it's the influential people, it's the people with money. They're the ones who get the voice and not the people off the street. Yeah. And yeah. that's how come it was an honor having both of you yeah, on yeah. the show today. Appreciate it. But yeah. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you to the viewers for tuning in to another segment of the Northeast Kingdom Voice.